First, I would like to thank the organizer uh, for inviting me to participate in this program, uh, also giving this talk, uh, especially Jurassic uh, Silva. Uh, we have worked together for <laughs> many years. Uh, so in this talk, uh, I will discuss using uh, first principle uh, computational method to study and design some materials uh, for uh, clean energy related applications. Uh, now I'm in Beijing Computational Science Research Center. So uh, let me first uh, uh, give you some introduction <laughs> uh, because we're not uh, that famous place. So I I'll let you know uh, what we are. So we are located in uh, Beijing, China. Uh, so this is the center of Beijing, the Tiananmen Square. Uh, we are in the Zongguanchun Software Park. Uh, that uh, actually most of China's uh, internet company uh, has uh, some uh, uh, headquarters or their office in this part. Uh, so this is our location, which is not too far from the famous university like Tsinghua and the Beijing University. And this is the airport, which is about uh, 40 kilometers away. Uh, so our center was actually quite new. It's established in 2009. Uh, it is an interdisciplinary fundamental research institute. Uh, it's focused on the uh, computational study. So basically we conduct basic and frontier research. Uh, they established this center mainly to attract uh, talents worldwide and promote uh, ex uh, international exchange uh, and collaborations. So actually we only have about 30 faculties there, but there are maybe 40 or 50 uh, visiting scholars uh, in our center. <coughs> uh, so currently we have seven divisions in our center and I'm in mean the materials and the energy division uh, in this center. So what we do uh, in, in our division, and this is the major, uh, sorry. This is the major activities we have. So one part is we also working on the PV materials. So in this case, we trying to uh, explain the underlying physics uh, of these PV materials and also trying to design new PV materials uh, based on the knowledge. And the other part we worked a lot is the, on the semiconductor, especially on doping uh, issues in semiconductor. So we're trying to uh, develop a theory, trying to understand uh, the doping limit in semiconductor materials and also trying to using doping as a tool to modify material properties, uh, semiconductor material properties. And we also work on nanomaterials and trying to find uh, new uh, properties and also develop a new calculation method to study nanomaterials. Because they uh, are quite large in terms of calculations. And the other part is to do this inverse design of novel materials. So before, uh, people just usually give you a material and you calculate its properties. Uh, now we're trying to do is, uh, for certain applications, you know what kind of properties you need, and then you're trying to identify or design materials that has these properties. Uh, we also do energy storage materials, both for batteries and the thermal storage and the hydrogen storage. And we also do some work on amorphous material, trying to understand uh, their uh, quite unique properties. Also on these catalytic materials, uh, trying to convert cell water into hydrogen, and also do the CO2 reductions. So these are the major activities uh, in our division. Uh, we have very good uh, facilities. For example, we have this Tianhe 2. Uh, supercomputer in our center. Uh, this used, uh, used to be the world fastest uh, supercomputer, uh, but now uh, it is not. But it is still quite large. It can uh, 
uh, have uh, about 200 or 300 people working at the same time using this computer. Uh, okay, so this is uh, our center. Now let me just uh, go back to uh, discuss what uh, uh, I'm going to talk today. So we know that uh, for developing this clean energy is very important because currently most of the say electricity is produced using fossil fuels and that can cause many problems, especially uh, pollution, the environmental problems. Uh, it also use a lot of resources, for example, waters. Uh, therefore, we need to have a more clean energy. And one obvious uh, resource is using uh, sun uh, light because the energy flux from the sun to the earth is very large. Uh, you only need to harvest a small portion of the sunlight, then you can satisfy the human beings uh, requirement for uh, energy use. Okay, so basically, uh, what we can do is to convert uh, solar energy uh, either directly into electricity, okay. or uh, convert uh, the sunlight uh, into some fuels, so say split waters into hydrogen fuels. Uh, for the CO2 reductions uh, to generate uh, uh, fuels. Uh, in these uh, missions, uh, the computational design is very important. And this is because for these new technologies, we need the new materials. And those materials should have uh, some unique uh, uh, structural, optical, electrical, and the thermal properties. Um, we know that this recent development in the computational method and also this computational power has made uh, it possible to do this, we call the knowledge-based material design. Okay, so after you understand uh, the uh, knowledge, then you can use in this knowledge to do the material design. And so because of this now, this uh, first principle material design has become a very important tools uh, to accelerate this uh, scientific uh, discovery of new uh, clean energy materials. So in our calculation, basically, we use uh, uh, density functional theory. This is quite a, uh, looks like a very simple theory, but it, actually it is not. So basically what it says is uh, if you have a system you know the charge distribution of the system, then basically it determines everything. Uh, it determines all the properties of the material. Uh, in order to, using this theory, which is basically a many body theorem, uh, so you can simplify this using the so-called Kongsham equations. Basically you write the total energy into a kinetic energy and the Coulomb energy and you put the many-body interaction part into this exchange correlation part. Uh, then you can do the variation and get the single electron equations, the so-called Kongsham equations. And then uh, the charge density in this uh, approximation is basically equal to the sum of all the occupied single electron state. Uh, you can use in many different ways to solve this, like uh, four potentials uh, or using pseudo potentials. Uh, basically, after you solve these uh, equations, you can get many uh, material properties. For example, you can get this total energy, and then you can use it to derive the structural parameters and the elastic constant, the stress force, or these thermal properties. You can also get the band structure, and from this, you can calculate the electron energy levels and density of states and also optical transitions from these. And also from the charge distribution, you can get electric field gradient and some transport properties and diffusion coefficient. It also gives you the magnetic uh, properties from this calculation. So after you get all these material properties, you can select the materials with target material properties. That is the key for material design. 
So this is basically what we do. So therefore, uh, in this talk, I'll give you some examples about uh, how do we think when we do the material designs. Uh, so these are the four examples, depends on the time I have uh, for the <coughs> talk. So the first example is trying to design uh, the stable and lead-free inorganic perovskite solar cell uh, absorbers. Uh, we know from yesterday's talk, uh, and I gave a very nice talk about this, uh, so for solar cells, there are certain requirements because uh, we have this sunlight which has a certain spectrum. Uh, for uh, the operation of a solar cell, the idea is actually quite simple. So basically you absorb a light, you generate an electron holes, then you can uh, extract the electrons and holes and then to generate powers. But uh, the power depends on the current the current depends how much light you absorb. And it also depends on the output voltage. The output voltage is basically determined by the quasi-Fermi level difference, but it is bounded by the band gap of the semiconductors. Therefore, if you have a semiconductor, the band gap is too small, then your output voltage will be too small, even though it can absorb a lot of light and generate a larger current. Uh, so after all the balance, then you get this shock requiser limit. That's the theoretical ideal limit, and the highest power you can get. Uh, this, because of this, it says the mat semiconductor materials should have a band gap about 1 to 1.5 EVs to fit the solar spectrum uh, to generate the largest power in, uh, in this range. But not just this, you also have some other requirement. For example, if you want to have a good uh, transport properties, then you will also require a good defect properties. You don't want to have many uh, recombination centers in this system. Uh, so for the solar cell development, it started in the 1950s with silicon as the major material, uh, but silicon has an indirect band gap, so the light absorption is not very good. So afterwards, people started to develop these thin film solar cells. They have a direct band gap, therefore they can efficiently absorb light. Uh, only using very thin films, they can absorb all the light. That's why they, you can make thin film solar cells. Uh, then later on, people also change from binary compound to ternary compound like CIGS, uh, uh, CIS or CIGS. Uh, then, uh, because indium and gallium are kind of uh, expensive, so people are also trying to uh, using the CZTS, which is more earth abundant, contains more earth abundant elements. Uh, nowadays, the most famous material is these perovskite uh, solar cells. Uh, like what was introduced by Anna yesterday. So this is because for this material, the efficiency goes up very quickly just in the few uh, years. Uh, <clears throat> so people are getting very interested to understand this material, why uh, this material has such a unique properties compared to other materials. Indeed, if you look at the band structure of this material, uh, it is very different from conventional semiconductors. Uh, this is because this material mainly contains lead uh, compound. Um, lead is a heavy element, so it has a large relativistic effect. And because of the larger relativistic effect, it pulls down its S orbital. Uh, so not like a conventional semiconductor, its S orbital is occupied, uh, it's below the valence band. So the top of the valence band here has the S component, uh, which is hybridized with the N and P orbitals. For conventional semiconductor, the top of valence band is usually N and P state, and the bottom of the conduction band is uh, S state. But for this system, the uh, 
it has, has an inverted band structure. The top of the valence band has S character, but the bottom of the conduction band has P character. And because of this, it has a very high density of states in both of the valence band and the conduction band. And due to the SP coupling, it also has a direct band gap. Therefore, this material has a very high absorption coefficient. Therefore, you only need the very thin layers to absorb all the light. Uh, because of this, then, even though the transport is not uh, as good as, uh, say, gallium arsenide or cadmium terrorite, uh, but because it's very thin, so you still can attract uh, all the absorbed electrons. There are also other issues, like a lead has a heavy atom, has a large relativistic effect, so the band edge is basically split, and it's not exactly direct. So therefore, the carriers generated can have a long lifetime uh, for this system. So all these indicate that it is a very good optoelectronic property. It also has a very good defect properties. Uh, all the, most of the uh, uh, defect that has a smaller formation energy that has a shallow <coughs> defect levels. Therefore, uh, they can be as a dopant, but not as a trapped state. Uh, this is mainly because this material has a weak bond. Uh, it is also ionic. So when you have an ionic system, you break the bond, you generate shallow levels, not deep levels like a silicon covalent bond. Uh, but because this material has these good properties, and uh, nothing is free, so you also pay the price, uh, it's mainly, say so most of the good properties come from lead because the system can lead. But lead also is poisonous, so uh, for the environment uh, safety, then you don't want to use in lead, so you want to replace the lead. And also because the bond are weak, and so the material is not very stable. Usually after you grow it, and after a few hours, it started to dissolve into binary compounds. So there are many studies trying to uh, design new materials based on this, but uh, it's more stable, um, but keep, also keep uh, these uh, good uh, electronic properties. <coughs> uh, usually for modifying a material properties, you either change the composition of the material, or you have the same composition, but you change the structure of the material, then you can modify. Uh, the material properties will change. Uh, in some case, if you have the same composition, uh, also same lattice site, you can change the arrangement of the elements inside the lattice, uh, then you can also modify the material properties. So that's the thing we tried uh, to see whether we can uh, have a more stable and uh, high efficient uh, proskite based material for solar cell. So you can try many uh, different atomic com uh, compositions and do a high throughput calculations to search their material properties. So one way you can do is to do the alloy. Uh, we know that uh, when you do the alloy of two different elements, uh, usually it will involve two different energies. And one is the strain energy because they have a different size, so you put them together, they will experience strain, and this strain energy usually is positive. Okay, so you make the system less stable. But uh, uh, because you have a two different element, and these two different element has a different electron activity, you have a charge transfer between them, and then you introduce uh, uh, extra cooling interactions. These cooling interactions are negative. Therefore, if the current interaction is dominant, then after you form the alloy, the alloy can be more stable than uh, the, uh, their end constitutes. Uh, in this system, because proskite is more ionic, so their, uh, its bond is also weak, so the strain energy is small, but the coolant energy is large. Therefore, if you form alloy, actually at certain com composition, you can find the system
as a lower energy than the sum of their con uh, constituents. Uh, so this is uh, what we tried for these anion uh, alloys. Uh, you can also modify the material properties. Uh, the other thing you can do actually is you can cut out from the 3D material and cut out a slab and make it more stable. And this, uh, intuitively, it looks strange uh, why you can get a slab out of a 3D material and then make it more stable. Uh, this is because when you cut out a, 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 a slab, you cut out then you actually form two surfaces. And for the broad sky structures, you hang out, you, after you cut out the bond, you actually have a AX and a BX2 surface at the same time. And one of the surfaces can be very stable, therefore if you keep just the slab uh, on both sides with the same stable surface, then it can be very stable. So this is indeed the case for this pearl sky material. You can make a slab that is more stable than its 3D counterpart. And this is another way to make it more stable. And a more often used way actually is this atomic transmutation. And so in this case, for example, here we want to replace lead, and lead has a valence two. So you can replace two lead uh, by one element has a valence one, and the one element has valence three. So you keep the same amount of electrons uh, in the bonding system, therefore you keep the octet rules uh, satisfied, and due to the extra cooling interactions between the uh, valence one element and valence three element, you can make the system actually more stable. So then you, there are many different uh, combinations of these valence one, valence three. So uh, we did a high throughput calculations, and you can actually find that the most stable structure for this one is the so-called double perovskite uh, structure. And you can find many of them has a stable system. And therefore, this is a good approach to make the uh, perovskite more stable. But uh, unfortunately, we did a detailed analysis of the band structure for this double perovskite. So if the two elements are both sp elements, then you find that it started with indirect band gap. Uh, then after you do the double perovskite, you have a band folding, uh, even though it looks like it's direct, but uh, because this state is folded from the R point, so they have the same parity. If the two states have the same parity, then they are forbidden for the optical transitions. So, uh, so for the SP, if both are SP electrons, then they, you have the forbidden transition. It's also like this, if a sodium indium has SP electrons, then you have forbidden transition, so even though it's direct. You can add this element with d orbitals, but these d orbitals only push this level up and reduce the band gap. It doesn't change the symmetry, so you still have forbidden transitions. The only way you can remove this is you add an element that contains lone pair S state. Because of the, the lone pair S state basically is you pull down this and make it occupied. Uh, so you put down this state, then this one is exposed. But if you only have one element that has a long S uh, state, then the material becomes indirect. Okay. So the only case you have a direct and the optical allowed transition is both of these elements also contains long pair S state. So either both are lead, or you change this to say, uh, indium or bismuth, but indium here is a one plus charge state, but it's unstable in this system. So because of this requirement, it limited what kind of element you can use to get this double proskite, which you also requires as a direct band gap and also has an optical allowed transition. So basically there, 
either you have a thallium here, a bismuth here, but thallium is more poisonous than lead, you don't want to use that. Uh, so basically, there is no good double proskite uh, satisfy this requirement. Uh, so then what we can do, uh, so for example, if you have this cesium silver bismuth bromine, which is a stable compound, people already grow this material, but uh, here you only have one element has a long pair state, therefore it has an indirect band gap. Okay. Uh, so also its band gap is kind of large, it's about 1.95 eV, and so it's not suitable for solar cell applications. But what we can do for the band structure engineering is that uh, you can make this element disordered. So when you make this element disordered, then you reduce the symmetry, therefore uh, the uh, forbidden transition becomes partially uh, allowed. Uh, also the band gap will change. So this is the case, so when this is a fully ordered double perovskite, so when you change it to fully disordered, the band gap is reduced. And if you do the projection, then you see that this is part, partially allowed transitions. <coughs> and then if you look at this uh, absorption coefficient, then you can see uh, the absorption is much improved uh, after you make these uh, cations on the B side becomes disordered. But if you calculate the order disorder transition, then you see that the transition temperature actually is quite high for this material at 1100 uh, Kelvin, but that is too high. Uh, but at this transition temperature, the band gap is about 1.46 EVs that is suitable for solar cell applications. Uh, then can we reduce the transition temperature uh, the answer is yes. Uh, what you can do is say, if you look at the band alignment between this fully disordered and the order structure, the band gap is reduced because the CBM is much now much uh, lower than this order structure. But in this situation, if you dope this material uh, uh, using donors, then the electron in the fully disordered case will located at a much lower position, so it will stabilize this disordered phase. So you can use in doping to stabilize this disordered phase, therefore reduce the transition temperature. So these are all the band structure engineering when you're trying to design some materials. Uh, so next I will give an example about design oxides for hydrogen productions uh, through PEC water splitting. And the concept for the water splitting is also quite simple. So you absorb sunlight, and then you generate electron holes, and the hole can be used to oxidize water, and the electrons can be used to reduce water and produce hydrogen. Uh, but there are also some requirements uh, for these type of semiconductors, uh, because uh, these uh, redox reactions has an energy separation of 1.23 EVs. Therefore, the semiconductor has to break uh, these reactions, uh, so the band gap has to be larger than 1.23 EVs. Uh, you also need a certain over potentials to drive the reaction, so therefore, usually people require the band gap as 1.7 to 2.2 EVs. And more importantly, because in this reaction you generate oxygen, therefore you must make sure that the uh, catalyst is still stable after the reactions. Uh, so if you look at the many of the semiconductors, there are some of these like cadmium selenide or cadmium sulfide that satisfy these band gap conditions, but uh, these materials are not stable in the uh, water environment, uh, therefore they are not uh, good for this purpose. Uh, actually, most of the oxides are stable under this environment, but unfortunately all these oxides has very large band gap, therefore they don't absorb much light. So 
none of the common compounds, existing compounds, meet all these criteria uh, listed here. Uh, so if you, we look at this titanium oxide, um, basically it satisfies all the other conditions except that its band gap is too large. Uh, it has a 3.2 uh, EV span gap. So with this band gap, uh, under even ideal situation, its largest uh, conversion efficiency is only 1%. Uh, if you can reduce the band gap to about, say, 2 EVs around here, then the efficiency can increase to 15%. Uh, but uh, to reduce the band gap, you also need to satisfy all the conditions because here the conduction band is only a little higher than the reduction levels. So you don't want to reduce the CVM to reduce the band gap. You just want to push up the valence band to reduce the band gap. So how, how do we do this? Uh, so we first calculate the titanium oxide density of state. Then we look at the component, see what's the component in the VBM and what's the component in the CBM. So if we look at the component of the VBM, then we see that the VBM has mostly oxygen P state. Therefore, if you want to push up the valence band, then you have to replace oxygen by an element that has a high p orbital energies. So then you look at this uh, variation of different elements, then you see that, say, nitrogen carbon has a high p orbital energy than oxygen. So this will be the ideal element uh, to replace oxygen. And the bottom of the conduction band is a titanium D state. Because you don't want to lower the conduction band, therefore you have to choose element that has a high d orbitals than titanium d orbitals. So with all these considerations, then we say, okay, if you can use a combination of carbon plus molybdenum, so carbon has two less electrons, molybdenum has two more electrons than titanium, so you can still form this with a band gap. And also, carbon will push up the valence band, and molybdenum does not pull down the conduction band. So you can s still satisfy these conditions. So indeed, after the calculation, and there are some experiments who followed up, then see the efficiency is increased with this type of doping. And then there is also a question about using nanostructure uh, oxides uh, for the catalytic uh, purpose for water splitting. Uh, but we know that usually uh, oxide material already has a larger band gap. If you reduce it to a small cluster and due to the quantum confinement, usually the bank, quantum confinement will make the band gap even larger. So is it possible to make the metal oxide uh, in a nanostructure for this water splitting? And the answer is also yes. Uh, this is because there are some unique properties for the oxide. Uh, so for the oxide material in the bulk material, say a titanium oxide, it has a band gap of about 3 EVs. If you just cut out of this titanium oxide without any preservation, uh, you see that there is no gap state in this material. Uh, the uh, band gap is slightly reduced. This is a unique feature for the oxides because it's ionicity. Okay. So you break the bond, uh, so the level just drop a little bit. It does not create mid-gap levels for the oxides. Uh, more interestingly is that if you passivate this oxide with real hydrogen, if you're using pseudo-hydrogen like in many uh, modeling calculations, the, uh, indeed, uh, due to quantum confinement, the band gap will increase. But pseudo-hydrogen is just an ideal case. It's not a real situation. In the real situation, you have to use hydrogen for the passivation. And then using hydrogen to passivation, you see that there is created a surface state, and that the surface state will reduce the band gap and improve the light absorption. And this is because uh, in a 
real hydrogen situation, you have these hydrogen levels that couple with the cation state and push this level down. Uh, it's because for oxide, the valence band maximum has a very low energy. So this level is still above the valence band maximum and reduce the band gap. This is not like in 3.5 or 2.6, uh, common 2.6 material that has a high band gap. When you have a high, band gap, uh, high VBM, and this level are pushed down below the VBM, therefore you just see quantum confinement. You don't see the gap states reduce the band gap. Okay. Uh, so the next example I want to show uh, is uh, um, our study uh, on the origin of self-limited energy density of oxide cathode material for these lithium-ion batteries. Uh, so this morning, uh, Professor Tony already showed uh, uh, some uh, limiting uh, <coughs> uh, origin for these cathode materials. Uh, so here we want to show from the band structure point of view why the energy density is limited. Uh, so we know that the lithium ion batteries has been widely used in our daily life, uh, but uh, uh, in order to uh, further uh, improve the cost, because the cost is still very high, uh, so we still need to increase the energy density for this material. Uh, so in order to increase the energy density, then we have to study how the lithium uh, ions are stored in this material. This is because when you do the charge discharge, uh, the lithium ion is say, removed from, so when you charge it, uh, the lithium ion is removed from the cathode. Uh, in the meantime, electron is also removed. So we need to understand how this process uh, happens. Uh, also, uh, people trying to uh, improve the cathode uh, energy density uh, by using lithium-rich compound. Uh, for example, like uh, this uh, uh, lithium ion phosphate uh, material. Uh, however, uh, later on people find that even though you can, the original compound has a lot of lithium in it, uh, the, the amount of the lithium can exchange during the charge discharge uh, process uh, is much smaller than the theoretical predictions. Uh, that is, uh, Many of the lithium uh, cannot be used uh, for this uh, battery uh, system. So then the question is, how do we understand uh, under what situation the lithium uh, uh, atom can be used or removed during the charge-discharge process? So basically, when you ch uh, do the charge-discharge system uh, process, when you remove a lithium, you also need to remove uh, electrons from the system. So usually people think that, uh, initially people always think that these electrons are removed from the transition metals uh, because transition metals are usually multivalence. That's why all the battery materials contain tra transition metals uh, because they can change valence and to keep the system stable. But recently, uh, like Professor Tony discussed, uh, people also find that actually many of the electrons are not coming from the transition metal, it's coming from the oxygen. So you have these uh, anion redox reactions, uh, but it's not clear why uh, it will come from the oxygen. Uh, then the third choice is, says you can also generate the electrons remove the electrons by create oxygen vacancy. Uh, because each time you remove our oxygen, you left two electrons in the system. And this electron can also be used for this uh, charging discharging process. So let's see what happens. Uh, so if we take this lithium uh, ion uh, silicate uh, materials, so in this case, if you look 
counter the electrons, you know this ion is in the two plus charge state. Uh, that is, it has a D6 configurations. In the high spin configurations, then you have five spin up and the one spin down. Then, if you take out the lithium, then you also take out electron, and clearly you want to take out the electron from the highest occupied state, then you think the electrons are taking out from iron. But uh, if you do the calculation, you find that actually uh, less than half of the electrons are coming from iron, and most come from oxygen. So what happens here is that if you take out the electron from this E state, okay, then the energy of this state will drop. If the energy drop, then it has a higher hybridization with the oxygen p orbital. But now it's the T state, hybridized with the oxygen p orbital. Uh, because of the higher hybridization, then the electron actually goes back from the oxygen state to the ion state. Okay. So the, you have a negative feedback. And this is what happens, and that's why you have much less electron actually come out from the transition metals. And if you keep taking out lithium, then you find that the next one, uh, most of the electrons actually come from oxygen, not from the ions. Here, because you don't have a state here, and the, you take out from the highest occupied state, and these states are mostly uh, oxygen P state. It has some iron D state, but uh, if you take out from iron D state, this energy will drop, then you have less hybridization, so then it has more P orbitals. So this is because this negative feedback mechanism, so then most of the electron actually is come out from the anion, not from the transition metals. Then there is also a question of uh, when the oxygen vacancy will form. Uh, so if you started with this uh, element, you have transition metal state here. So if in this case, if you create an oxygen vacancy, then you generate the oxygen vacancy level has two electrons here. But because this state is occupied, then this electron has to occupy this high energy levels, therefore the formation energy is very high. If you take out uh, uh, some electrons uh, from the transition metal, but you still have the state here, the electron can drop to this transition energy level, but uh, if the energy level is higher, then the formation energy is still high. Only when you have the, uh, after you take out the electron, enough uh, electrons, the transition metal energy level can drop below the oxygen P level. So then uh, you create a hose near here, so then the uh, oxygen vacancy electrons can drop all the way down and gain a lot of energy here. Then you have a negative formation energy, then the oxygen vacancy will form spontaneously. So this tells you that in order to avoid the formation energy, of oxygen vacancy, then this level has to be high. But if this level is high, then the voltage is low, then uh, you have less uh, energy density. So there is a balance between the stability and the energy density. Uh, so in, when you're trying to design the material, then you have to consider both to optimize it. Okay, uh, because of the time limit, so I will not talk about this uh, last uh, uh, topic. So, uh, basically I showed that uh, first principle method can be used to uh, study and design these uh, new materials that can be used for clean energy applications. Uh, it is uh, very important because this first principle study can give you uh, a deep uh, insight about the process uh, in these energy conversions and storages, and that have, can help you accelerating the uh, discovery of new materials. And this work was done with uh, my postdocs, and uh, also thank you for your attention.